Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 13. So uh, before we get started, I kind of wanted to um, give a little preface about what we're going to cover this week. So if you remember last week, we were furthering our ability to do uh, parameterization and generation uh, with the functional programming features of Scala. And this week, we're kind of going to continue to expand our repertoire of abilities to parameterize and make generators. But I also do want to spend some more time kind of talking more about the actual design process itself. Right, so later in the week, we're gonna be covering things like how can we use uh, you know, object-oriented inheritance and things like that to best make reuse of things. And in general, our goal with these generators, of course, is to build a reusable component. And so today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about design process as a case study from start to finish of what if we wanted to design our own queue. So now, of course, chisel.util provides us a really good queue and we recommend you use that but going through the process of designing it, in particular, uh, appreciating all the steps along the way is okay for me about, right? Where it's one thing to have a nice polished thing at the end, but I don't think it's often uh, taught enough to talk about how what it takes to get there, right? It's not simply you just write the first time and it's that polished. It's a matter of uh, understanding how to get something working and then keep improving and revising it and uh, have this kind of very iterative, gradual, progressive way of developing software. Or just, sorry, I should say in this case, hardware. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, as I said, uh, we're going to talk about design for reuse, right? It's kind of our goal. Our goal is to have this very agile, nimble uh, development process where we can, you know, save ourselves a lot of time by using generators that already exist. Uh, and because the reason why, of course, we want to use these generators is they solve the problems we need. And the generation gives them the flexibility to kind of solve the needs we have for our problem, right? So we want to kind of go after that. And then we'll talk about how we're going to kind of keep improving this queue. So please do stop me uh, to ask questions and make sure we're kind of all on the same page. It's kind of a good example of kind of demonstrate a lot of things we talked about in terms of, oh, here we could use, you know, this feature versus that feature, or how might we do this differently? It's a great time to have a discussion. So please stop me with those kinds of questions. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and load in uh, the stuff. And so as I said, the goal for a reuse, right, is to make a reusable component. You need to appreciate there's some use case that, you know, either you or your component's users are gonna be envisioning, right? Now, maybe a very specific function is satisfactory. Like maybe there's an exact hash somebody wants, such as we've been asking for in the homeworks. And we need that exact hash. And, you know, a simple black box, you know, completes that task. However, maybe uh, you would like for it to be more flexible. Maybe you want to change how many cycles it takes. Or maybe you want to uh, do a slightly different hash or something. Um, those are the kind of things where if you had a static component, you wouldn't be able to reuse it. But with a generator, right, now you had to put the flexibility into your uh, component so that way somebody can realize, oh wait, my scenario is a little different than your scenario, but guess what? The flexibility that's needed is there and I can go ahead and use that. Um, so that's kind of the, the goal, right? And so what you kind of appreciate is what's the pattern people are doing? What, what's the thing they're using it for? And then perhaps try to guess some of the things they're going to be using and how they may differ or how they may uh, introduce various things, right? And so. With that in mind, you can have to think about, okay, what sort of parameters or knobs I want to add to my generator what, in order to handle these use cases, right? And maybe the case of something you can think of is this too different uh, to do with a simple generator. Maybe you need to have a different component or a different generator. Or maybe you need to have a super generator which has multiple generators inside of it and based on your parameter, it chooses which one of those generators internally to use, right? These are all possibilities, but you kind of need to get some sense of what your goal for this component is uh, and what kind of use cases you want to support. And with generation, of course, we can support a wider range of use cases than you could if it was a static component, but you still need to kind of think about those and try and recognize what pattern or what functionality you're trying to reuse and what ca capture. Um, and so as part of this agile design process, I really recommend a kind of an, a progressive approach where rather than trying to go waterfall at once and build a very large component, instead we really recommend kind of taking this iterative approach, right? So uh, the reason why this is good is, you know, as you probably have already experienced in homeworks, occasionally you run yourself in a situation where it's hard, right? You know, it's not working. It's a lot to wrap your head around to either write the current thing you're trying to write, or if you're trying to debug it, it's a lot to debug. Um, it's, it's, it, can, it, can be, it can be daunting, right? And so the goal is to try to avoid those scenarios, right? And so to avoid those scenarios, one way to do it is to take smaller steps at a time, right? If we can, you know, take these little baby steps and, you know, add a feature, test it, understand it, great. Add a slightly small, another feature, test it, understand it, great. And by kind of taking these little tiny steps, we actually can go pretty far, right? 
And so uh, my advice here is, coming back to one of those course themes, is close the loop, right? Get your design and a test bed uh, working together as soon as you can in the design process, right? It's not like I'm gonna spend a lot of time designing this module, build this very, very complicated thing of all these features, and then write a very big complicated test bench. No, simple module, simple test bench, get it going early, right? Is kind of the goal. And then uh, we can keep adding features on. We can add some bells and whistles to our module. We can add some bells and whistles to our test bench. We can test for more finger test bench. And so in order to kind of take this progressive approach, right? Uh, it's about closing the loop early, right? And so in order to close the loop early, we have to be willing to say, you know what? There's some things we're not gonna do on our first version, right? So whether it be certain functionalities or more often optimizations, we can defer those, right? Uh, we can do those later. And that's the nice thing about, you know, designing hardware with software, we're actually building this hardware, right? We're just making a program which generates the hardware, right? So it's really easy for us to change it, right? By making our generator one way and then decide to change your mind and revise it. We haven't broken anything. We haven't ruined anything. We haven't wasted any materials, right? We've just decided that uh, we got something working we understand and now we're gonna build something more complicated we understand, right? And so the goal is we're kind of taking these small iterative steps. So when you first look at your problem, the goal is to do whatever you can to kind of think about what's the simplest thing I can kind of imagine against the gist of it and go from there, right? And in some ways, this concept isn't completely foreign, right? Uh, you perhaps you're all familiar with the concept of a hello world, right? And that is when you're learning a new programming language, simply just making it print out hello world on the command line or the console of some sorts is a good first step, right? Because that's kind of a test of, can I write a program that compiles in this, or validates is interpreted in this language? And can I execute it? And can I know or see the output, right? And to kind of connect those dots, right isn't always trivial in some cases especially if you're learning it for the first time but once you've kind of done that it's like oh wait now i have a program that's running and i can see the output well perhaps before i print out a static output maybe it's be more intelligent right so kind of that initial first step is what you might do in the software world we're proposing something similar to hardware world right trying to do what it takes to get that close that loop as early as you can in your design process and then we can figure out ways to you know add more features or optimize it in particular to optimization I really recommend deferring that almost always, right? It's rare you want to do that early. Uh, and the reason why is you should be sparing on your optimization efforts, right? Because uh, you don't know you need optimization until you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do optimization until you know you need it, right? Uh, until you have seen the entire design and determined this particular unit is taking up too much area or too much power or is hurting the critical path. Until you know that, it may not be a problem, right? Uh, and by introducing complexity to try and optimize something that you don't even know what, if it's necessary, is a problem. Additionally, uh, necessary or unnecessary, you should also shouldn't optimize unless you're measuring it, right? And so, so far in this course, <laughs> we've been just running things in digital logic simulations. We haven't really been looking at resource costs. Now, we hope to introduce a CAD tool later in the quarter as kind of uh, to get some sense of physical feedback about uh, what some of the costs are. But that'll be later. And the reason why we scheduled it for later in the quarter is because we really want you to focus on getting your design correct and then worry about optimizing in a second, right? Now, maybe some trivial cases, you can convince yourself that, oh my gosh, you know, this is, you know, quadratic scaling and resource usage when it should be linear. So yeah, I can go ahead and fix this and save myself some cost. That might seem really obvious and maybe sometimes it is, but perhaps if the end is the number of things you're dealing with is small, that difference actually may not be that big, right? And so I really emphasize getting things correct and working and then optimizing and waiting to optimize until you, number one, can measure to know if you improved it or not. Because quite often, some design changes optimize things or have a trade-off, right? So it improves one thing at the expense of another. And so until you know the cost, you don't know how that trade-off is being balanced, uh, et cetera, right? And so, like I said, you can kind of see this plan here, right? Make the simplest thing you can possibly think of and then kind of revise and extend it. What are you making, adding more features, or making more optimized. Now, it's not bad to have a plan, right? You're kind of imagining all the features you want in your uh, component. You can maybe have like a roadmap, you know, okay, well, I'll do this feature first, and then with well, this feature, it's easier to build this other feature, and then this other feature is, can build these other two features, and you kind of just see, work your way up the food chain complexity, so to speak, right? Um, and all these made this nice and tidy plan. In typical agile fashion, midway through, you may decide that, you know what? That feature is not even needed. I don't even bother building anymore. Here's this other feature, which I didn't, consider before, but I really, really need, need to do it now. Embrace the Agile, be, be flexible, but at least have a plan and you can change the plan just like you can change your design. Whew. Okay, so that's kind of a 
very brief uh, philosophy about what we're doing here. I and mean, we'll take any questions in the general before we move into the concrete uh, queue problem. Okay, well, uh, let's talk about designing this queue. So, uh, you know, why are we talking about a queue? Well, uh, it's a nice component. There's actually a scope of, you know, internal microarchitectures you can consider that are simple enough I can describe and fit on slides and cover in the course of one lecture. And yet it's sophisticated enough where there's actually are multiple microarchitectures you can consider. There's actually trade-offs. And we're like, oh, wow. Um, and uh, you see a few things at work here, right? So as a reminder, right, we're talking about the queue like we saw on chisel.utils. So it has a decoupled interface on both sides and coupled NQ, uh, sorry, decoupled NQ and a decoupled uh, DQ. Um, and so what do we want to go about doing, right? We want to have some parameters. We want to be able to parameterize how many entries there are. Uh, we also want to parameterize the data type. Uh, you know, what, what kind of data we can pass in through this queue. And we also want to optimize uh, design, right? So in hardware design, you may hear this phrase PPA amongst hardware designers. That's power, performance, and area. So it's kind of putting them all together, right? And so you can imagine there's um, some amount of ambiguity what's going on here, right? You can imagine, well, uh, you know, under what circumstances are we measuring these things? Uh, you know, it's performance cycles or clock rate. There, there's some wiggle room here. But in general, when we say PPA, we're talking about, you know, the performance of a specific physical implementation, right? So in order to talk about PPA, you usually need to have some way of actually mapping or it to a technology and actually seeing the costs, right? Um, okay, so let's say we've chosen to do a queue, and we already know based on our details, and we want something to have a couple interfaces on both sides, and we know we want to support a variable number of entries and different data types. So what might be our way about getting a foothold as soon as we can? Well, if you think about these features, maybe we can kind of pare those down a little bit so it's simpler. So for example, uh, maybe we can worry about parameterization less on day one. Maybe we'll not have so many parameters and some things will be fixed and we'll just get it working and we'll go from there. Uh, and perhaps if we look at optimizations for performance, uh, perhaps it won't be as fast as possible, right? We'll see ways to improve it. We'll note those down, record them so that we don't forget about them, but then we won't do them until later. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead. So for example, you know, especially with these uh, decoupled interfaces, right? Uh, you know, if data comes out later, but, you know, it's not marked as valid until it actually is there, and then when it's marked as valid, here's the data, that's okay, right? Now, perhaps maybe when we use a scenario, we have a specification that requires certain time behaviors, but part of the point of a decoupled interface is a little bit more decoupled, right, as the name gives, right? It's more agnostic, right, where you're kind of determining what the time behavior you want is, right? So maybe your model is a little, uh, for testing, maybe it's a little too picky, and we'll come to that later. Uh, but let's, let's go with it. All right, so... Uh, let's, oops, I'm going to fix the slide right now because it's going to be annoying otherwise. Uh, that should be a slide, sorry. Um, great. So let's go ahead and simplify, right? So our first queue is going to be a single entry, right? We're not going to parameterize the number of entries. Um, and so what are we going to have? We're going to have uh, a register that holds the bits, right, that we want to transfer. And we're going to need some other register to kind of track is our queue have an entry that's there. So I, kind of, I call this the full. Is it full? You know, meaning one, something's in there. Zero, it's empty. Right? And let's talk briefly about why it's necessary, right? Because uh, let's say we have some more bits coming in. Assuming all possible encodings are valid, there's no way for us to know otherwise if this is garbage data or a valid entry, right? And so we did something like you know, saying, oh, this is not zero or not negative one. That wouldn't necessarily be okay because perhaps zero and negative one is a valid thing communicated through this queue. So we need this extra bit of state to kind of track, hey, do I have something there or not? So this is the full bit. And we have to figure out some logic to put in here, right, to kind of figure out, okay, based on this full bit, how do I figure out, you know, if I'm valid or ready on both ports? But in terms of the data, the data flow, we, we understand, right? The data is going to come in here, uh, you know, for the bits, and it's going to go out. Uh, we can just always attach the bits going out. In terms of the writing to this register, it's not shown. But there's probably some sort of write-enable control coming from what this logic we haven't quite figured out yet. But for getting started, right, we simplified the problem, right? We just want a single entry queue. Um, so we're going to go from there. Okay. So uh, in terms of simplifying the other aspects, 
we did have a parameterized bit width, but it's still a uint, right? And actually today, it's always going to be a uint. It's not going to be until Wednesday we're talking about how to make that like an arbitrary type. Uh, it's one of these things where Scala's type system is really, really powerful and cool. We talked a lot about that. Um, making that sophistication play nice with chisel uh, requires some boilerplate. So before we go fight those dragons, uh, we'll, we'll do that on Wednesday. <laughs> um, but for now, we're going to be have parameterized uint. So that's a semi parameterized type. Oh, you know, you can imagine casting a lot of things to a uint bits. And so even without the flexibility, we're not totally giving our users a poor experience. Um, but we are only a single entry, right? So yes, there's a single entry. This is a register to hold that data. Okay. And uh, this full bit, which we're originally going to start saying, hey, we're not full, you know, in the first reset. So how are we going to go ahead and do our logic here? Well, uh, when are we ready? Uh, we are ready. Maybe I'll comment this out right now. It's already an example of optimization. Uh, when we're not full, right? And, uh, you know, when with something we can share with someone else, when we are full, when something's in our entry bit. Uh, you know, as we said before, we're connecting our, our output bits directly to that entry. And then, how do we do these things? Okay, well, if we're dequeuing, uh, we're going to, you know, uh, mark ourselves full, it's empty, right? Because, sorry, the full business set to false, which is kind of the way of saying we're empty because, you know, of course we, we dequeued our element. And, uh, you know, if we're enqueuing an element, uh, of course we want to then conditionally update entry to have those new bits and we want to mark ourselves full. So this little uh, thing works. Um, Let's go ahead and test it out. So uh, this is our Q model we wrote, uh, I believe that was a few lectures ago. And we used it to test the built-in Q in Scala. Uh, so you know we wrote the Scala model to kind of beha model the behavior. It's a little bit more sophisticated, right? It actually has a number of entries in here. It has the ability to do pipelining, which I haven't quite covered yet, but we'll use this model just barely. Imagine we had a simpler model for day one. Uh, and we'll go with that forward that model and then let's keep going. Oops. So yeah, we have um, uh, set that up. And once again, the slide markers seem to have been dropped right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put that back in. Okay, so uh, we defined uh, you know our harness. Remember the harness is taking in RQ in this model and trying to send data appropriately in particular. It's, is it trying to enqueue data? Is it trying to dequeue data? And what data is it trying to send? Okay, so let's go ahead and actually run this, right? So here we are uh, saying, um, oops, uh, you know, eight bits wide, right? This is the, 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 the bit width, one entry. Okay, and let's go ahead and run it. So uh, what happened? Well, uh, this test case assumes the queue was pipelined. Uh, meaning that, you know, if the queue is full and I, ca I can simultaneously enqueue and dequeue at the same time. Now, perhaps in our first version of our logic here, we didn't think to do that, right? Um, and that's an optimization. So something you can kind of postpone. Uh, because we're going to quickly drown in the Scala models, I kept the more advanced pipeline Scala models, so in which case we're going to go quickly improve our design. So in particular, uh, let's talk about this case where if I'm full, so if I, if I have if I have nothing in there and I'm empty, obviously I can take data and I'm ready. If I do have something in there, that doesn't necessarily mean I can't take any data. It could mean I can pipeline and I can accept a data the same cycle I'm dequeuing, right? So remember, a queue is about handling a throughput mismatch. Uh, even if I'm full, if somebody's enqueuing to me at the same time they're dequeuing, there's no mismatch, right? So it's okay for me to accept the enqueue at the same time I'm dequeuing. Um, it's only when I can't dequeue and I'm trying to enqueue, right, then we need to talk about it, right? Because if I, if I can't dequeue and I'm trying to enqueue, well, then as we start filling the queue up, right? But when we're able to dequeue, right, then we're able to kind of flow things through, right? And so, uh, yeah, so this is, you know, the, the case where, you know what? Actually, if I'm able to dequeue, um, I can go ahead and allow it to enqueue, right? So that small little change, uh, we go forward and uh, we can retest it and it should now pass. Oops, oops, I have to go uh, redefine that test harness and then there it goes. Okay, 
so yeah, now it works as we expected. So uh, we built a single entry um, queue. Uh, right now, our tester model is a little bit more sophisticated than our uh, chisel model. That's, that's, uh, that's okay. <laughs> but what we've done is we've got a foothold, right? I mean, if you look at this code, go back a few slides, even the optimization we just talked about, that wasn't super mind-blowing, right? That was perhaps something we can kind of think about and reason about and understand what's going on. And you kind of see the case, especially with a single entry, that scenario of the queue being, you know, full and trying to end queue occurs very quickly, right? If I had a really deep queue, this might not happen unless I had a very, you know, good coverage on my test cases. So in some ways, having a small queue is actually kind of good for us to kind of develop it, right? So we can kind of see that play out. Uh, neat. And it said, this is a nice little tidy short queue implementation. And perhaps this in register is all we need for a lot of cases, right? Uh, so this is our V0, right? Um, so let's kind of take score, right? So uh, what do we do? Well, we have queuing behavior, right? We can put things in there and come, come, come out. Even though we weren't parameterizing too much, we can parameterize data with, uh, you know, maybe I'll say uh, still uh, limited to uint, right? But that's not bad. But the biggest shortcoming, of course, is we have only one entry, right? And that's a big one, right? Maybe you want to have an arbitrary depth queue. But we did get a good number of stuff done. In terms of efficiency, uh, well, we haven't no numbers to measure it, but if you go back to the hardware, it's not super complicated, right? What are we talking about? Well, we're gonna need register bits to hold the things going through the queues. That's kind of fundamental. And then how much other stuff are we talking? We're talking a single bit for this full bit. And you can see a little bit of combinational logic here, right? We're talking like, you know, a not gate, an or gate, dq.fires, and an and gate, you know, Maybe some mux is to do these kind of when conditional connections. So it's, it's not a ton of logic here. Remember that uh, in particular, you know, these things, uh, you know, are single bits, right? So they're perhaps single bit muxes or perhaps even just turn into gates, right? It's not super complicated. Uh, and then this one, yeah, there's a mux on these bits or perhaps it's uh, a write enable register. But, you know, that's also kind of somewhat needed. We need to have the ability to kind of fundamentally to have something be kept uh, there. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna pause. Any questions on V0? We'll stay here while we're talking about V0. Any questions on the V0? Okay, so uh, that's, that's the V0. So we said the biggest issue was we only have one entry. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about being a little bit more flexible there. So in particular, what if we can parameterize the number of Q entries, right? So, whew. So require a little bit of thought, right? Because now we need to kind of start thinking about how we want this thing to kind of be structured, right? So perhaps maybe a first attempt, and if you're worried about certain flaws, hopefully we'll address them in the future fix versions. Uh, maybe we can use this as a shift register, right? So uh, how is it gonna work? Well, the data is gonna come in to the one end of the shift register, it's gonna come out the other end of the shift register. We're gonna use some single bit registers to track if a given entry is full. And you can see that these entries are gonna shift down along with these things. So we'll know at the other end, this is a full thing or not a full thing. Um, we're gonna need to figure out some combinational logic to control all this. And we're gonna have some parameter, which you know is our number of entries, right? So this is kind of the goal. Okay, let's go try this with a shift register and see what we can do. Uh, and so let's see how this goes. Um, okay, so we have the same, you know, IO. For now, we're gonna say number of entries needs to be greater than zero because we're not gonna worry about combinational pass through. Um, okay, so how are we going to make our entries? Well, for our shift register, we're going to need a collection of uh, registers, right? And so in particular, in this case, I chose to do it a seek of reg. Now let's talk about that choice for just a moment. So when we have a collection of items in our chisel designs, you have a choice of do I use a Scala collection to hold my chisel items or do I use a VEC, you know, from chisel? Now. Some users' instincts are to think, oh, wait, you know, this is a, these are chisel objects, I should use a VEC. Um, not necessarily, right? Uh, you need, use a VEC when you need chisel things in the elaborated hardware to be able to dynamically address things. If all the connections are static, that is, they are known at the time you are running your chisel, Scala program to generate the hardware, you'll be just fine with the Scala collections. Not just just fine, you'll be happier with the Scala collections. <laughs> VEC is really just there for that time. We need to have that dynamic addressing, that dynamic connectivity uh, for your designs. So in this case, for that shift register, I have to go back a slide. Oops. Uh, raster that and go back. Um, this connectivity pattern is not changing, right? Uh, so this, it's going to be uh, good to have those um, as a seek. Uh, you know, 
Likewise, we have a you know a set of bits for our full bits, and we're gonna initialize them all to empty, right? So let's go look through some of this stuff. So for example, um, for that shift register, we kind of probably want some sort of control to say, hey, should I shift down or not, right? Um, and so uh, what's that gonna be? Well, if I'm dequeuing uh, or um, the uh, last entry is empty. So let's talk about this for a second. So these full bits, we're having this encode a convention of one indicates that associated entry uh, is occupied with useful data. Zero means it's not. Um, cool. And then uh, we are inserting at the high index and dequeuing at zero. So you can see that here. So here we're using the Scala thing. So this is the same as saying, you know, entries zero. Uh, you know, but using dot head and dot last, uh, you know, it's kind of a more natural way to kind of get things across rather than just to do n minus one. Um, so what are we saying? Okay, so, you know, if, when do we know there's room? Well, we know there's room if the last entry where we insert things is empty, right? It's not full. Or if we're shifting down or not. So this we talked about last time about being able to, you know, NQ and DQ at the same time. Uh, and then, um, is anything valid to DQ? Well, is the last entry valid? Okay, so then it's already getting a little more complicated to kind of find all this logic. Now let's kind of start talking about what's actually happening inside of this, right? So in terms of shifting, what's it going to do? Well, for our, our shift slash DQ, uh, we are going to, um, uh, for every entry, we are going to... Um, uh, take it from the one, one index high, right? So if it was index two is now copied to index one. And remember, this is a connection, right? So this is a connection between two registers. So even though it looks like we're doing this now, of course the impact is visible next cycle, but we're making that topology connection right there. And we're doing the same thing, row for entries and our full bits. And then, you know, uh, because we're dequeuing, we're shipping everything down, coming into the top, uh, we want to mark that newest entry as empty because we didn't really pull anything in there. Uh, also notice that I didn't go all the way in the entries uh, because it was plus one here, right? So right away it was going to go off. We're taking, you know, I and I plus one. So if we go all the way to, you know, our max value, we're going to go off the end. So that means, you know, our entries, uh, you know, num entries minus one, which is a valid location, is not going to get assigned on the left side. That's okay. We'll come to that in just a second. So that's for shifting down. And now for enqueuing, for shifting in, uh, well, of course, we can use this decouple interface to know when it's firing. Uh, and then we are going to set the bits in that last entry, which is the one we insert. So we're inserting in last and removing uh, from head. It's a little backward you might expect, but this is consistent with a lot of other ways of designing things. Um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, enqueue those bits. Okay, great. And because we enqueued something valid, we're going to go ahead and mark that as full, right? And notice how we have two places where we're assigning the same thing, uh, but you know, last connect semantics, right? So if we had to shift down and no NQ, then it would be false. Uh, and then no matter if there is or is not a shift down, if we have an NQ, we set it to true, right? We're overwriting it. Okay, I'm gonna pause here before I talk about the comments and doing this thing functionally. <laughs> Any questions so far? Okay, well, let's go ahead with uh, this. So we can go ahead and run it. All right, uh, and let's go look at it. So if we test it, probably need to rebuild the simulator again. Yep, I don't know why I'm gonna have this bug. It's very frustrating. Okay, I have that recreated. Great. Okay. So at least for this simple example, it seemed to work. You know, maybe I'll go ahead and uh, try um, enqueuing some more stuff. Actually, before I run that, I'm going to appreciate the prior input for just a moment. Notice how, okay, our queue was empty. We enqueued a one. And even though we were ready to DQ, DQ is true over here, it took another second before it came out, right? 
That's a shortcoming we're going to cover in just a second. The way you have the ship register set up in that prior topology, if I go all the way back to the beginning, uh, you know, every element goes through all of these entries, right? And if this queue is mostly empty, that's perhaps not a good automation. It's kind of like fixed latency, right? Or it's not even fixed. It's minimum latency, I should say, of num entries. So that's, that's not going to be a good thing. So that's something to go ahead and fix. But it's, that's in a, maybe an acceptable compromise just to get our first parameterized one running, right? As I said, pick something simpler, get it working, get it running, then optimize, right? So that's already kind of a shortcoming, right? We didn't try to get it super awesome. We're just saying, hey, we're taking things in and it comes out and yeah, it's simply go through all these steps. Okay, so that's why that's two steps there. If we go ahead and put some more things in here, we can do that. But we still see that, you know, it takes, the occupancy here is two cycles, right? It takes two cycles to get through because the queue is too deep. If I made this uh, three deep, uh, it would take, you know, the, the one would spend three cycles in there, right? And that's because we're actually actively able to DQ here. This is true, right? If it was DQ is not true, it would take even longer, right? Um, so that's definitely a shortcoming. Uh, that's one thing we're going to address in just a minute. But let's go back a slide and try our newfangled functional programming. Um, so we have uh, quite a bit of logic here versus these functional expressions. So what do we have down here? Um, if we look at what we're doing, okay, we're essentially assigning each entry to the prior entry. Uh, okay, and there's this kind of this corner case where actually the highest entry we want to assign to n qubits. Um, and uh, okay, and here we only assign it to n qubits, the top, the, the incoming bits, when we for sure are enqueuing. However, we actually could always assign to that and just not lose track of the full bit and mark that as not full. So what marks it as full or not full? Uh, the answer is uh, ionq.fire. So uh, with that in mind, let's talk about why this kind of does the same thing. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing, but for the way we just developed this queue and its limitations, it accomplishes the same thing. So we're going to fold. We're going to give a specified direction. And uh, we're going to go through it. So uh, because of the way we index things, going zero being where we pop from and high and where we put it in, we had to um, uh, use fold right. Now, if we wanted to perhaps reverse our convention for the indices and use fold left, that would also be OK. But so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to take some of our fold right is starting from the highest index and working its way down. So we're going to start the, our original seed value is going to be you know, the incoming bits. And remember that the fold takes in two arguments, right? It's the thing so far and the, the uh, sorry. Uh, normally it's the thing so far in the current element, but because it's fold right, it's flipped. That's why I usually try to avoid fold right when I can. I often might just do reverse and fold left, but we're doing fold right to be consistent. Okay, so uh, as you can see here, I kind of name these things so I don't lose track of them. And yeah, I'm just connecting this entry to the last entry. So that's a deliberate side effect we want. And then I can put a semicolon, and then I'm returning this entry, right? Because if you remember, um, fold or map, they return something, right? In particular, it's not just returning the overall collection. We actually haven't saved the overall collection. But what matters is we need to have something come out of this function execution to be passed on to the next function execution, right? So it's part of the fold process, right? And so uh, we are saying, hey, we want to return this entry. Uh, so actually, it's like a, basically a two-line mini function. We crammed in here with a semicolon. You can maybe gripe about that stylistically. But uh, this functional code uh, does do the same thing as what's above, for the most part. So there's some subtle differences about the exact corner cases, but, uh, you know, that's there. So uh, it's fewer lines. Is it simpler? You know, maybe worth debating. We can talk about, you know, is this totally a clear use functional program or maybe an egregious, uh, you know, overuse. Um, we have to save some lines in the classic way of doing it by taking advantage of the fact that you use the same for for both of them. But yeah, so there, there we have this. Uh, questions on V1. Okay, so maybe I'll go ahead and uh, leave it as is. We'll use functional programming in some of these later modules, maybe not so aggressively. Um, okay, so then also notice how even though I'm using four, 
I'm using everything as index, there's no var here, right? And so when possible, really, 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 really avoid use of var. Helping some students debug their code, uh, we've been coming across some vars, and uh, now that we know about functional techniques as well as how these folks better, we can avoid them, right? Um, why is var so important to avoid? Uh, not just for, you know, immutable functional programming style points. Uh, turns out, uh, remember with chisel, right, we have this colon equals for connecting things. So if you have a var of a chisel object, you can use that to, you know, colon equals its other thing, connect to other thing, just fine. Let's say you make a typo. Oops. Instead of that colon equals, you write an equals, right? Pretty convincible, simple thing you'll do. Um, what's going to happen? Well, now you're going to reassign that chisel var to whoever's on the right side of that thing. So what it meant to be a connection is now a reassignment. And the chisel compiler is probably not going to see that as an error, right? Because chances are, if you're connecting two things, they probably have compatible types. They're probably both the same width or whatever. So it's going to be like, oh, you want to reassign that var? Go ahead and reassign that var. Now, if that chisel reference was a val, and you accidentally forgot that colon and your colon equals, you're not going to have that problem, right? Because if you actually forget that colon equals, like you're reassigning to a val, right? And so that's probably a good way to deal with it. It's kind of like having valves, which are pointers to things, right? That are immutable pointers. And then the things you have, right? You can have these deliberate side effects where you have them reconnected differently, but it's not changing my ability to access an entry, right? I'm not reassigning that variable. So it's, you see, even though I'm using for loops here, no var, right? Avoid var uh, when you can. Okay. Uh, so if we uh, keep going, let's go ahead and uh, you know take a take a assessment of our v1. Uh, so what do we do? We have the community behavior. We now have a parameterized number of entries. Cool. That's a feature we gained. Uh, as we just talked about, there's a long latency when the queue is empty, right? We still have to go through all of the entries. And one thing I didn't talk about because our test case is too simple. If you look at our design a little bit, you have a number of entries in there. If there's bubbles in the um, middle of the queue, it doesn't really handle very gracefully. And by that, I mean, uh, you could have you know, like a full entry at the bottom, no DQ, some bubbles in the middle, some entry, empty elements, and then you end queue at the top, and it's like, oh, okay. And as long as you're not DQing, it's going to have, let's say, have like a four element queue, right? So full element in the bottom, two empty elements in the middle, full element in the top. And if you're not DQing, let's say there's no room, even if you have two bubbles in the middle, right? So what you really want is you really want to kind of compact that down and have no bubbles. Right, um, no, no empty spots kind of way. We kind of fragment our free space in a way that's unusable. Because we're only inserting at the end, only dequeuing at the other end, and if there's bubbles kind of scattered in between, it's just lost space. Um, that's, a, that's a shortcoming, right? But sometimes such shortcomings, especially when you're aware of them, are okay in order to get something working, and then we can go ahead and improve it. So let's go ahead and improve that. Um, so, like I said, the issue we had was that these middle bubbles, uh, these sorry, middle entries could be become uh, you know, full of empty things, we're really compact them out. And the secret is we don't want to have bubbles at all, right? So what we're going to do, it's not shown in this picture, is we're going to use a priority encoder, and we're going to not insert only at the end, we're going to insert in the first free slot, and that's where the priority encoding comes from. It's going to help us find the first free slot. Um, and with that, uh, hopefully we're going to do a better job, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and see that in the code. So actually the code is not super different, right? We have kind of the same stuff. You know, we still have uh, our entries, our, our full bits. Um, now we're going to also want to know the negation of these. And so a really easy way to do that, here you can use that functional program arguably pretty naturally, is a little map call, right? Hey, we have these bits, reach these bits corresponds to an entry, uh, you know, one if it's full. If we want to talk about if it's empty, which is the reverse, right? We can just say, hey, take those bits, map them and negate them, right? So it's, it's, this is the, you know, the placeholder syntax, that wildcard, right? And then we're just saying, hey, we're gonna go ahead and negate them. So now we have empty bits, right? So for example, you know, when are we ready? Well, we're ready when there's at least one that's empty, right? So in other words, we could say, for example, uh, take those empty bits, which is a, you know, um, uh, you know, collection, and we're gonna go ahead and reduce them uh, with an or, right? Are there any empties? Now, let's briefly look back for a second and see what we did for collections. Remember previously they were seeks, now we've changed them over to vex. And the one wrinkly to remember is, if you wanna mix reg and vex, regs go on the outside. I always forget this, in my mind I always think of, oh, I want a vec of regs. No longer supported in chisel, the way to do it is a reg of vec. 
Um, there's some underhood reasons for this, as I kind of covered before, but uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so the reason why we wanted that is we're going to need that dynamic addressability in just a moment, right? So we want to actually have the ability to do, have the chisel in the actual design, when it's actually instantiated, have the ability to dynamically address. So that's why we need to have a Vec here rather than just a chisel seek, or sorry, a Scala seek. Okay, so how are we going to kind of things up? Okay, so we have, uh, you know, uh, we're always dequeuing from the tail. So that's still the, sorry, from the head. It's still going to stay the same. And so that's as a valid. We can look at that full bit. But then when it comes to um, dequeuing, okay, well, same thing like before, right? We're going to kind of shift everything down. And we're going to mark the uh, top thing, which I can maybe go ahead and change this to a dot last to make consistent. Uh, you know, mark that as false. Okay. And now uh, where it gets interesting is for when we're inserting, right? Because we're inserting at the first available slot. So how do you find the first available slot? The priority encoder, right? The priority encoder, you know, we have multiple bits that are, multiple slots that are marked as empty. So there are going to be multiple true ones in this VEC. It's going to pick the lowest one, right? And so this is why I chose to have zero be the spot we're dequeuing from is because we want to NQ as close as we can to that DQ spot. And so, uh, you know, if I force my indices to be the other way around, I could, and the priority encoding's backwards, right? So the priority encoder by default in Chisel prioritizes lower indices first, so we want to, that's kind of why I did this thing from the prior version. Um, okay, so what have we done? Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and find the first free slot. And, uh, you know, you might be asking yourself, wait, we, we learned with priority encoders, you know, what happens if there is uh, no, you know, uh, you know, no requests? Well, we can rest assured there is going to be a request because let's talk about the NQ fire, right? And when is NQ fire? When IOTA NQ ready and valid are both true. We control um, val the outside, valid comes from the outside, but we control ready though. And we're setting ready to be if there is at least one true empty, right? So if there's at least one true in the empties, then we're fine, right? So, okay. So we know it's at least one true. Then priority encoder is going to spit out uh, a number, you know, an index, which is the index of the first bit that was one. And that's going to be what we're going to go ahead and write to. So we want to address into the entries to write the bits coming in. And we also mark that as full. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, and so, yeah, now we're kind of using the priority coder to kind of put it into the first free slot. Uh, when we're dequeuing, everything shifts down. Uh, and due to the last six semantics, we're also kind of um, setting ourselves up this way of this thing being second. Um, Although, to be honest, I'm not sure if this version, if there's a bug with simultaneous NQ and DQ causing a bubble, there might be. We'll see. Um, but cool. Okay. Uh, questions on this? Okay, let's go ahead and uh, run it. Uh, we defined our class. And if for whatever reason, Ammonite, so let's say I need to rerun... Sim cycle. I don't understand why to keep redefining it. This is uh, a little annoying. Um, oops. Okay. And then, all right. So there's a, a simple case, right? But um, you can imagine more sophisticated cases also passing, right? So here's an example of kind of progression, right? We start off with a really simple single entry, went to multi entry shift register, which, you know, had some issues. Now with the priority encoder. We are squeezing out a lot of those bubbles. There might be a raise condition or a condition that can cause a bubble if there's simultaneous NQ and DQ. But other than that, you know, we're, we're doing a lot better, right? So let's take let's take our inventory, right? So we have the queuing behavior. We still have parameterized number of entries. Our latency now is based on occupancy, right? So if the queue is empty, I'm only going to spend one cycle in there, right? I'm not going to spend four cycles uh, based on that, right? So if I go back a slide, uh, you know, and I made this queue four entries deep. It's not going to spontaneously, you know, make this take a longer to get through. It still comes out right away. That's the big advantage of the prior version. So we made this higher performance in terms of latency, in terms of cycles, right? That one had more cycle latency, so it's lower cycle latency. That's an improvement. Um, what did it cost us to do that? It cost us the priority encoder, which, uh, you know, is not free, but it might be affordable, especially if there's a, a large, if the entry width is, you know, pretty big compared to the number of entries, then... This probably is a pretty reasonable expense. Um, sometimes priority coders, if you have a very big priority encoder, you know, say I have like a priority encoder of 512 bits, that may become a problem for clock period. But, you know, hopefully your queue isn't that deep. Uh, and this may be a totally reasonable design. 
Uh, and if you later do analysis and find out, oh my gosh, then my priority queue on eight entries is uh, on the critical path, then maybe to go in and figure out how to change that. And so that's, that's an example of kind of something we kind of deferred. So we said, so what are some shortcomings? Well, we have this issue with simultaneous enqueuing and dequeuing is, is not great. Uh, we talk about power a lot in this course, but if you were to talk about power, what's kind of some way to think about it? Uh, one is, you know, less hardware often is less power, right? Uh, lower clock frequency often takes less power, yes. Um, another thing is less bits shifting or changing value uh, is less power, right? And so in particular, the shift register approach, right? We're shifting basically every full entry uh, when we want to shift something. So that's a lot of bits shuffling around. So that's going to cost some energy. As we said before, right, this priority encoder, if you have a, you know, uh, a deep enough queue, that's going to grow. And the priority encoder grows logarithmically, so it's not super bad. Uh, if it's a fast one, otherwise a linear one. Uh, that could be potentially a critical path. So there may be some things to kind of keep in mind on in the future. So let's go ahead and try and fix those. Um, so one way we can fix some of these problems is keeping data in place. So this is an idea that, you know, transcends hard design is also common in systems. It's the notion of a circular buffer. So what you do for circular buffer is you have a fixed size of memory, right? This could be done in memory in the software. It could be done in hardware, you know, registers. And what you do is rather than moving data around to kind of have enqueuing and dequeuing, you change what you think of where you should pull data from, right? So in particular, you have pointers or indices, whatever you want to call them, and you insert into uh, the cell pointed by the in pointer and you remove from the out pointer, right? Um, so take, for example, to DQ. Well, uh, you know, you would read the value at the out pointer, which is one in this case, and then you add one to this out pointer and it moves over one index, right? We'll take the in queue. Well, you write a value to the in pointer and then you increment in, right? And so uh, what's kind of interesting about this is you kind of are moving the pointers, but not the data. The data gets put in and once it's put in, it's never going to move, right? It can be read, it's going to be written in, it's going to be written out, it's going to be read out later on but it's never going to move, right? So data stays stationary, uh, but these pointers was moving around, right? And the places where we're inserting or, or, or reading from or popping from uh, are moving, right? So that's, that's what's moving, but the data itself is not moving. Also worth noting that, you know, you wrap around, right? That's the circular portion, right? So here we have a six entry thing. So you're taking your index mod six. So if you add one to, you know, five, it comes six, wraps around to zero. So that's how you implement that uh, circular buffer. Now, a ch common challenge circle buffer is, is how do you know when it's empty versus full? Uh, you know, because for example, if in and out are equal to each other, uh, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that I've filled in these last two slots and it's completely full or is it completely empty? So there's different conventions. Uh, for our first take, taking the simple one, we're going to say, hey, uh, when these pointers are equal, it's empty and it's full when in is one away from out. So what does that mean? Well, this, this, the approach I described, we're sacrificing one uh, element to take the child care of this case, right? So when n is right here, we're not going to be able to uh, NQ anymore, even with a free slot, because n plus one equals out. And the reason why is if we actually moved in all the way over to out, then we will differentiate them. And so we'd lost information. So for first attempt, we're going to sacrifice a, an element to uh, keep track of when it's full, effectively. Okay, so let's go ahead and implement this. So what are we doing? Well, we're gonna go ahead and implement this, as you know, our, 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 our things. I had an idea for optimization, wrote a note, note to myself for the future, maybe I should use a mem. Um, then in terms of those uh, pointers we described, here we are using registers. And so how big are they? Well, they are the number of entries, uh, you know, log two of them, of course, and we're initializing them both to zero. So we're kind of starting off zero, zero. And so, yeah, we say it's empty when they're equal and it's full when I add one to the incoming one, if that equals the decoming one, right? Now, how are we getting that modulo wraparound behavior? Once again, to keep things simple, I said the number, the number of entries needs to be a power of two. Uh, and I'm taking advantage of just binary arithmetic, right? So here we're using that, you know, modulo addition. It's not growing. And so, yeah, it's going to say, hey, is this thing constrained to those number of bits not grow? And so here we're constrained to power of two. Of course, later on, we could remove that and use a mod operation here to get the right behavior. Um, 
So let's kind of see the logic rule, well, which is kind of decomposition. In some ways, it kind of gets almost simpler, right? Uh, you know, when are we ready to accept something? When we're not full. When are we ready to uh, decuse something? Uh, when we're not empty. That's hopefully pretty straightforward. Uh, now it starts getting a little more interesting, right? So where do we DQ from? Well, we have to DQ from where that pointer is pointing, okay? And what does it mean when we actually do a DQ? All we're doing is advancing uh, the pointer, okay? And then um, could I DQ when I was empty? Uh, no, right? Because in order for DQ.fire to be true, DQ.valid must be true, in order for DQ valid to be true, we must be not empty, right? So we don't have to worry about this pointer breaking itself by being not empty, okay? And then um, what about enqueuing? Well, if the enqueuing condition is such that we are not full and we're able to enqueue, we go ahead and write the place we said we're going to write to and, you know, take the bits we're going to take, and then we uh, increase this pointer. Now, um, I put the lines in this order because that's what makes sense to me uh, mentally, but remember that, you know, the index is a, is a register, right? So the new value is not going to be visible to the next cycle. So we could have just as well have written it in that order, and it would have been just fine. Uh, but uh, we wrote it in that order because it you know, kind of tells you what we want to do. Remember that when you connect to a register, you assign the value for next cycle, right? So cool. Okay, here's our uh, you know approach using a circular buffer. And if we go ahead and uh, here, uh, I left the sim cycle in place. And what happened? Oh, uh, something went wrong. Well, what went wrong is we have a mismatch between our model and our design. In particular, remember we said that even though we um, uh, have two entries, we're sacrificing one to mark it as full. And what's happening is after enqueuing one thing in here, uh, even though we have two entries, that other slot's kind of there, it's becoming marked as full right away. So, uh, you know, that's kind of what I lost. So, for example, I made this a four and had more space, no problem, right? Uh, and I couldn't make it a three because it required it to be a power two based on the way we're doing the arithmetic. But, you know, uh, you know, we gained some, we lost some, and it's transition, right? So sometimes when you make a design change, it's not going to be 100% improvement. There's going to be, you know, some trade-offs, right? So if we, take, if we take a toll on what we just did, we say we have the current behavior. Uh, we have a parameterized some of our stuff. We have a latency based on occupancy. That's good. Efficiency, well, we have less bits moving around and hopefully shallower logic, right? If we go back to the design, we don't have the priority encoder anymore, uh, right? So uh, hopefully our logic's not as complicated, right? It's just a couple comparators and some, uh, you know, there's some arithmetic for, uh, you know, incrementing this stuff, but it's, it's effectively constant, right? It's not gonna be growing too fast. Um, so uh, uh, that's better in that sense. But as we said, we lost one entry for this weird math thing. We're talking about this full empty thing. And right now we're required to be power of two. Um, and uh, the way it's written so far, we actually lost the ability to simultaneously NQ and DQ. We had that early on, then we lost it. So like I said, sometimes you kind of go forward and sometimes you don't go forward. So let's, let's go ahead and try and fix some of those things, right? So the issue is we need a way to differentiate uh, when the two points are equal between it being full and empty. So one way to do that is we need another bit of state. So we're gonna go add this uh, register, simple single bit register called maybe full, which is going to uh, handle that case, right? So in other words, we are, uh, you can see both empty and full, in both cases, the indices are equal to each other. It's just full, it's, they're equal to each other and we're maybe full, versus when we're equal to each other, we're maybe empty, right? Okay, so, uh, you know, we can set our ready and valid based on that. We're still reading from the DQ spot, but then we have to worry about how do we set maybe full. Okay, so if we're DQing and the indices are no longer equal, okay, we can unset maybe full. And if we are enqueuing and we're going to enqueue such that they now become equal, then we're going to mark it as full. Okay, so uh, great. So that that's that. So, okay, so we have this little uh, tweak we just did. And now, uh, you know, uh, you know, it works just fine um, because we're able to use that second entry, so it's not putting premature back pressure on our design. Uh, but, you know, we still have the, uh, oops, I'll go back. We still have the issue that um, we can't do simultaneous NQ and DQ. 
and um, required of a power of two number of entries. So, uh, you know, uh, let's talk about simultaneous NQ and DQ. Uh, well, it's actually not too hard, right? Basically, we can say we are not full. If we are full, but we're DQing, go ahead and do it. Simultaneous NQ and DQ has been reachieved that simply. Uh, so why is it not default? If you remember, the chisel util uh, Q module also has a parameter for this option. Uh, the reason why is we now introduce a combinational path between our incoming ready and our outgoing. Uh, yeah, we've now in, uh, caused you know a combinational path between these two, right? So there's now a path from our input ready coming on the DQ port to our output ready going out on the NQ port. And depending on how other things are connected together in the couple design, this could be the thing that closes a combinational loop. And so oftentimes, especially involving these NQ, DQ kind of ready valid signals, if you can avoid connecting them, often you, you should, right? So we can do simultaneous NQ, DQ, but we, there, there was a price. We now connect to these things, which uh, in certain instantiation contexts, we may introduce a combinational loop. Otherwise, uh, it's uh, the same. Uh, okay, so we can go ahead and, uh, you know, run it. Uh, and we can even see, for example, now that, you know, we're able to um, uh, be pushing on simultaneously at the other end. So cool, okay, uh, that worked. Um, let's do a little more tidying, right? So uh, if you remember what our limitations were, we no longer have the entry lost due to uh, that thing we're talking about, or the maybe full. Uh, we also could do simultaneous NQ, DQ, but uh, we still want to kind of tidy the code up right a little bit. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to put in a parameter to control whether we want to do that, you know, simultaneous NQ, DQ. We also can kind of go ahead and change some of these fields, right? So for example, uh, to do all the work on the uh, indices, we can go ahead and just use the counter, right? In this case, the counter is a little more like an object, right? We give it kind of a num entry. So it's an implicitly count from zero to num entries. And when we want the counter value, we can simply say something like, hey, give me the dot value. Um, when we want to increment it, we can say something like, hey, increment that, right? And this is going to be Internally, that function inside the chisel, of course, is causing the uh, you know connection to be made to add one and wrap around. So now we've actually, in theory, don't need that restriction anymore. Uh, and uh, for expressing things conveniently, I saved the comparison, and then you know you can see if they're equal and maybe full or not full. Um, and uh, actually, I refactored the logic for maybe full. And it's perhaps going to be a more intuitive way of thinking about it which is if the indices are equal and our NQ and DQ rates are different, then it should toggle maybe full, right? So it's two cases to think about, right? There's a case when I'm empty. If I'm uh, empty and, uh, you know, I can't simultaneously NQ and DQ without the flow parameter, of course, uh, I only can NQ, right? So that's not going to happen. So um, if they're equal... And, uh, and I'm NQing, I look at NQ, I can't DQ when I'm empty. Uh, this is gonna get forced uh, toggled from zero to one, right? Now, in the case when I am at one, you know, when I am full, and this are equal, uh, I can keep NQing and DQing, and it's gonna stay full, that's fine. Simultaneous NQ, DQ. Now, if there's ever a case when I'm full and the NQ and DQ are not the same rate, uh, in particular, uh, you know, I can queue and not DQ because that's going to overflow. So it's going to be a DQ without an NQ. Uh, if that's the case, then I'm no longer, uh, you know, full to the brim, uh, in which case I can toggle that off, right? So it's kind of that interesting optimization. But otherwise, you know, hopefully this is maybe a little bit tidier. Uh, I could also even change this to a mem, as we talked about before. Uh, so our uh, reg of vec is the same uh, as mem by default, and sync read mem is the one that has the longer uh, latency. Um, you can't see it, but it says defined. Uh, and then we go ahead and run this, and uh, boom, uh, there we have our you know more flexible thing. Which you know, for example, if I said give me a queue of three, it's not going to complain. Uh, I could even you know watch it fill up. Oops, my model doesn't have three entries. That's a example of repeating myself and that's having different values. Uh, okay, well, there you have it. So there's our, you know, much improved Q. And if you compare what we have here, it's actually getting not too different from what's inside of the Chisel Utils implementation, which once again, I recommend go look at yourself and you can learn a few things from it. 
Uh, in terms of major shortcomings we have left, really it's just we're kind of assuming that our data is a uint, right? And so in order to kind of move beyond that, we need a little bit more object-oriented inheritance kind of tricks to kind of template that. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's getting, getting more reasonable. I'm going to pause for any questions. Oh, so, yeah, so the, the question was, can I clarify my comment about the mem versus regevec? So by default, uh, mem has a combinational read, as when you get the data back the same cycle, uh, sequential write, right? The, the write takes, you know, a cycle. That's the same behavior as a regevec, right, where you have uh, registers like that. Now, if you want to have something like an SRAM, which has, you know, both a sequential read and sequential write, there is the uh, alias for sync read mem. There's also a way, I believe, with mem to provide parameters uh, that are named that can give the various latencies. Uh, in terms of what you use in your code, uh, I tend to, uh, uh, mem is really kind of handy and convenient in a lot of ways. And it's obviously, of course, shorter to write than uh, reg of X sometimes. Uh, I tend to use mem even when it's not actually like an SRAM memory. Uh, when I kind of think of having few ports, when I think of having a lot of ports, I like thinking about thinking of having in terms of a uh, collection, in terms of VEC. The other advantage of um, the VEC is I believe, I'm not sure if a mem allows you to do the functional operations on it. So if you want to do like a map or reduce, I'm not sure mem allows that. Um, and the, uh, with the VEC, the VEC should. Um, so that's kind of the differentiation point there. But uh, here we know this is in many ways designed to be going into memory where we have very few ports, right? We have, you know, essentially uh, one read port uh, and one write port, right? So this is, you know, could be done with a memory other than the fact of the, the delay of accessing, right? Um, so we're kind of on that trajectory. Versus before, we really kind of had a lot of different things we're kind of reassigning. But yes, uh, reg of vec isn't exactly the same as mem, but functionally the same. In terms of looking at the emitted Verilog, the mem is often tidier. Um, the other difference is in mem, it's not so easy to initialize all values versus the reg of vec it is. So there, there's some trade-offs, right? So, um, yeah, good question. <laughs> cool. Okay, well, this is uh, also for two because this is the last slide. So this is kind of a nice way to kind of see end-to-end -end on design process. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up, and I'll stick around for just a second if there's any last questions.